A quick new idea daily from the world's greatest TEDx talks. I'm your host, Atosa Leone, and this is TEDx Shorts. Men do this because they're wired that way. Women behave like that because their brains are different from a man's. If there's a neurological theory of our gender differences, Gina Rippon has probably heard it and maybe even discredited it. Gina's a neuroscientist and author of the book The Gendered Brain. She explains that gender gaps come not from the ways our brains are built, but on how we interact with the world. Male and female brains, then. Did you know that currently there are only six women in charge of the biggest 100 companies in the British Isles today? Such a small figure, it's outnumbered by the number of male chief executives who are called Steve. (laughs) The world is full of gender gaps. And where do those gender gaps come from? Across the world, we see all sorts of different gender gaps in achievement, in political involvement. So we really need to ask ourselves, what is it that's causing these gaps? Blame the brain has been a very popular mantra. Men and women obviously have different brains. Presumably those Steves at the top of their game have got more efficient uh, brains, uh, certainly bigger brains, of course, uh, than the Angelas and Zoes scrabbling around in the, in the lower reaches of their, of their organization. But we need to remember that this story started well before we even had access to the brain. So let's have a look and see what kind of story uh, has been devised about the brain and how female brains and male brains get to be different. This is what I call the the biological, biology is destiny pathway. The fact that male brains and female brains arrive in the world slightly different. If we track the pathway of the male brain, it gets bigger and bigger, acquires all those necessary skills and resilience to make them uh, Nobel Prize winning scientists or explorers, etc. Female brain, slightly more fragile, perhaps not with the uh, necessary skills that would allow allow her to be hugely financially or scientifically successful. But she does arrive at the the developmental end point as um, a very emotionally perceptive individual, perhaps a bit emotionally labile, but full of all of the characteristics necessary to make her a womanly companion of man and a good wife and mother. So these were the kind of stories that we were looking at um, when we were actually uh, going back into the 18th, 19th century. Before they could look at the brain, there was a clear message. Men and women have got different anatomies. This must involve their brains. Their brains um, unfold, uh, some kind of biological script inevitably unfolding, reaching a fixed, hardwired endpoint. Men's brains were different from men's, women's brains and there was no um, way in which you could change that story. And that explained how society evolved. And all at once, there was an explosion of really excited research. If we look very carefully um, at each of those different studies, several things emerge. First of all, although it looks like there's lots and lots of papers proving differences, when you look at them individually, quite often they're talking about different differences. So somebody will say, uh, men have got a bigger structure X, Very often it's phrased in that way for particular reasons. Um, Whereas other people will say, oh, I looked at structure X and it was exactly the same in men and women, but I found that men have got a bigger structure Y. And so the story unfolded. And then so it looked as though we had lots and lots of proof. Really, that story didn't quite hold up. And it was also the case that the scientists who made firm statements about fundamental sex differences forgot to really emphasize the fact that the differences we're looking at in brains or in the behavior that we think is supported by those brains are very, very tiny. The variability within groups of males and within groups of females is much bigger than the tiny difference between them. As a neuroscientist, I have to stand up in front of you today and say, I do not know the difference between a male and a female brain. You couldn't give me a brain and say, is that from a man or is that from a woman? I couldn't confidently point at a brain image and say, that's a woman doing this or that's a man doing that. 
So the kind of story that has emerged that men and brains, men and women's brains are different, hasn't as yet stood up to the test of quite a, a, an intense onslaught by these hunt the difference researchers. But we still have gender gaps. So where do they come from? Has 21st century neuroscience got anything useful to say about where these differences come from? Is it something we should be paying more attention to? Should we new neuroscientists come out from under our scanners and have a look at the world around us and see, could that be changing the brains of male, males and females in interesting ways? The first thing we need to realize is that our brains are wired to make us social. We have an amazing array of cognitive skills, linguistic, creative, scientific, musical. Generally speaking, we have many more social groups, wider social groups. We have a clear sense of social identity. We have a clear understanding of the social rules of engagement for our in-groups. We also identify out-groups. And we have nice little stereotypes, uh, which are useful cognitive, stere uh, cognitive shortcuts, demonstrating that men are like this and women are like that, and we interact with them accordingly. The other thing we need to realize is that this all starts very early. We used to think that human babies arriving into the world as apparently highly efficient noise or excreta producing machines actually were rather patronizingly referred to as like subcortical, being rather helpless. But human beings, human being babies, we now know arrive in the world with hugely finely tuned social antennae. They like tiny social sponges and their brains are working very hard right from the beginning, picking up social cues from the world around them. And this brings me to the three Ps. First of all, our brains are predictive coders. We always used to think the brains were a bit like um, wonderful uh, computer type machines which processed any information that came to them, which they do. They are hugely efficient. But we now know that our brains are also making future predictions, that actually what our brains do is quickly take us through the world via lots of shortcuts, lots of guesses. You might think that we're actually being driven around the world by a guessing machine. But actually, usually the brain is highly efficient. So our brains are predictive coders, a bit like sat-navs driving us around the world and, and keeping us out of trouble. We also need to realize that our brains are plastic, that they respond throughout our lives to the kind of experiences that we have, and that we really need to know that this isn't just true of baby brains, it's true of all the experiences we have. So the events and, and experiences we have will change our brains throughout our life. If we're a taxi driver, the bits of, and doing the knowledge in London, the bits of the brain responsible for that will get larger as we acquire the knowledge. If we have a look at um, what looks like spatial uh, sex differences in particular kinds of ability, they look like innate ones because they're always, men do much better on spatial tasks than women. But actually, if we take into account different kinds of spatial experiences that individuals have had, have they played with construction toys as a child? if you want to improve somebody's spatial skills and overcome a sex difference, just give them three months of intensive Tetris training. They will, uh, their brains will change and also they will be better at spatial tasks. So what looks like a sex difference is in fact not a sex difference. Similarly, our brains are permeable. They're not just information processing systems, um, impermeable, uh, which are unaware of the kind of social information around them. They will solve a problem in the context in which it has been presented. This brings us to the conclusion that the world is a brain influencer, that what's going on outside the brain, we should be looking at both neuroscientists like me and perhaps all of you contemplating that. We should say, is there any possibility that our world is just a tiny bit gendered? Could it be that these plastic permeable uh, predictive brains are being exposed to different experiences, different stories, different attitudes and expectations. We are continuously bombarded by information about gender. And I don't know if you're aware of the existence of gender reveal parties, where 20 weeks before a baby even arrives in the world, a scan will pretty reliably demonstrate that it's going to be a boy or a girl, cue for a huge party uh, where you can release blue balloons or pink balloons, eat blue uh, cakes or pink cakes, and have different kinds of um, 
congratulatory messages if it's a boy as opposed to if it's a girl. So this society really codes this difference importantly. And the pink or blue tsunami that washes over tiny babies when they eventually arrive is another powerful code. Toys. I've already mentioned the importance of construction toys. Who gets to play with Lego um, and who gets to play with a princess doll? We need to look outside our world. We need to understand that our world is just as brain changing as any kind of genotype or hormonal marinade. So the take home message is very much a gendered world produces a gendered brain. The TEDx talk you just listened to was recorded in Cardiff, United Kingdom. All TEDx events are independently organized by volunteers who believe in TED's mission of ideas worth spreading. Special thanks to the organizing team at TEDx Cardiff. Want to listen to more TEDx talks? Explore the entire archive on the TEDx YouTube channel. I'm Matosa Leone. Thanks for listening and see you tomorrow.